Welcome to Baptist for Liberty. I'm your host, Joanna Works, and today is Tuesday, July 15th. As I indicated in our yesterday's program, I'm going to be looking at Israel in specific and news stories related to what's currently going on in that region, both Israel and some of her neighbors. Um, before we get started, I do want to share a verse of scripture. Proverbs 18, verse 13. He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. I don't have all the answers. I'm not going to claim to have all the answers. I'm still looking at some of these news stories. Um, but I want to share some of these. There's going to be things in here you disagree with. That's okay. The truth is, people have different views in you. They do. And I know when it comes to a hot topic issue such as Israel, we get emotional. And, you know, especially, we're talking about people's lives here. People have lost their lives. And that that is an emotional thing, whatever side you're on. So, you know, just, I'm not going to claim to have all the answers. I'm not going to claim that everybody I'm quoting is right or accurate or telling the truth. That's not the point. The point is to understand that this is how other people view things. And realize that sometimes um, we only have part of the picture. Okay? And, um, alright, so let's get started. First story, I decided we're going to have to go back and look at some older stories other than the ones from last week because you know there's been a lot of things going on here the first I heard about the three boys being kidnapped it was from an ultra liberal uh, website news source and they often just bash on Israel and so I didn't feel comfortable with bringing it up at that time and the, at that point, it was that if they were the Israeli government was still looking for the three boys, it was before the bodies were found, and the article was on that Israel was um, bombing uh, Gaza, even at this point. Is that accurate? I don't know. I haven't seen anything else to say that they were bombing them in the Gaza Strip while still searching for the three boys. Okay, so I went back. Um, there's this n news source here. It's um, I'll monitor, and it covers different countries in the Middle East, including Israel. So this section of the website is Israel Pulse. This particular article is written by Akiva Eldar. He's a columnist for the um, I'll monitor's Israel Pulse. He was formerly a senior columnist and editorial writer for Haaretz and also served as the Hebrew Daily's U.S. Bureau Chief and Diplomatic Correspondent. Okay, so that's who this author is. This was published on um, June 16th. And it starts off talking about uh, Palestinian prisoners and prisoner trades um so let's go here it's been almost two months since a group of palestinian administrative detainees went on a hunger strike april 24th a significant number of the hunger strikers have been behind bars for years without being told what they're accused of and without being put on trial a hunger strike is a drastic step but it is considered a legitimate non-violent tool in most of the western world None of the Israeli authorities have signaled any willingness to negotiate with the strikers or even to offer a conciliatory gesture to restore calm as they have done in such instances in the past. Alright, I'm going to skip down a paragraph here because this is where I think it actually gets um, a little interesting here. It would appear to be more than a coincidence that the unusual kidnapping of the three teens 
June 12th occurred at the height of the hunger strike and in the Hebron area. Some 90 of the 120 striking prisoners are residents of Hebron and its environs. Many Palestinians term the current strike the strike of the Hebronites. Not only that, two of the kidnapped boys, Naftali Frankel and Gilard Shard, are students at the Mikorhim Rebbanical College located in the nearby settlement of Kafar Atzion, the first community to be established in the West Bank after the Six Day War. The leader of Habayat Ha Yahudi party, Naftali Bennett, recently declared that he was determined to advance a plan to impose Israeli sovereignty over this region. Along with the decision to spread speed up the le legislative process of the force feeding bill and Bennett's annexation declaration, Kinzit members from the high right <sighs> Kinzit members from the right tabled a proposed law that would ban the release of prisoners as part of any deal with the Palestinian side or as a goodwill gesture. All these initiatives play into the hands of radical elements in the territories who object to the Palestinian Authority's PA policy of nonviolence. Israel's parliament is teaching the Palestinian public that Fatah's policy of restraint and dialogue does not advance its release from occupation nor even the freedom of detainees who were never convicted. On the other hand, Hamas terror attacks brought about an end to Israel's occupation of the Gaza Strip, and the 2006 kidnapping of soldier Gilad Shalit brought home hundreds of murderers who were condemned for life sentences. Okay, so this is a strange thing. Here you have uh, a group of Palestinian prisoners with no charges filed against them, no trial, no conviction, trying to peacefully protest their own imprisonment by going on hunger strikes. And they get no negotiations, yet violent people who attack and kidnap people and they get negotiations for murderers who were convicted, who were sentenced to life, you know, in prison because of their murderous deeds. It's really off balance here. And it certainly does send a bad message. On June 12, several hours before the kidnapping of the three Israeli teens, most of the shops and places of business in East Jerusalem shut their doors. A Palestinian journalist told me that he could not remember such an extensive strike in the city since the end of the first Intifada some 20 years ago. For some reason, the Israeli media ignored the unusual event. The next day, police forces clashed with young Palestinians leaving the al aqaza Mosque after Friday prayers. According to Palestinian media reports, 28 people were injured and 8 were arrested. On the afternoon of the same day, the official site of the Hamas movement operating out of Gaza called for the launch of a third infitada in the West Bank. The announcement by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that Israel holds the Palestinian Authority responsible for the well-being of the missing also played right into Hamas's hands. Holding the PA responsible for the safety of Israel Ailes in areas from which its people are banned portrays the authority as Israel's punching back. Netanyahu is not satisfied with the fact that in recent years Palestinian policemen have handed back dozens of Israeli citizens who entered the Palestinian controlled area by mistake. He demands that the Palestinians defend the settlers who are viewed by international law as transgressors who violate the rights of local residents. The incitement against the authority, just like the harm done to the Palestinians living under Israeli control, exposes the weakness of Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas and of the shrunken Palestinian peace camp. Placing blame on Abbas is another manifestation of the phenomenon which Ephraim Sneh defined in an interview with Mazal Mas Malum 
as propaganda and brainwashing. A. La Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi propaganda chief who argued that if you tell a lie often enough and keep repeating it, people will come to believe it. Before denigrating Er Abbas, Natanhu should examine his own backyard. It's hard to count the hundreds of cases in which skilled Israeli security forces fail to pass the very bar that Nahu is placing before the PA security forces. The U.S. State Department counted 399 hate crimes carried out by Israeli citizens in 2003. The vast majority of these crimes were not solved. The Israeli government and its security forces never took responsibility for settler shootings toward Palestinians, arson at mosques, uprooting of olive trees, and incursion into private Palestinian lands. These are always unusual acts carried out by stray weeds. Of course, none of this justifies the kidnapping of unarmed youths. Unlike a hunger strike and other nonviolent means, this is a severe act of terrorism. The eruption of joy and distribution of candy in Palestinian communities to celebrate the act of heroism is stupid. The kidnappers from the Etzion settlement block, just like the unarmed Palestinian youth from Betunia, who was killed by live Israeli ammunition May 15th, are the victims of helpless leaders. It's to be hoped that the hostages return home safely and in good health. However, this being sometime after the kidnapping, we know that that didn't happen. Um, you know, they, they were murdered and their bodies were found. And, um, I don't know, they, I can't think of anything in common on that. The next story here, and I, I think I read this yesterday, but after the bodies of the three Jewish boys were found, um, and it's a Palestinian boy was burned alive in retribution. And there was an article saying that the families of um, one of the slain Israeli boys and the Palestinian team turned to each other for comfort. And this was published July 6th. The families of murdered Israeli teen Naftali Frank Ol and murdered Palestinian teen Mohammed Abu Kedar are drawing comfort from an unexpected source, each other. Jerusalem Mayor Nur Barkat took to Facebook on Sunday to write about an emotional and special telephone conversation between two families that have lost their sons. He said that during his visit to the Frankel family home, he had a chance to speak to Hussein Abu Kedar, Mohammed's father, and express pain at the barbaric murder of his son. Barkat then suggested that Abu Kedar speak to Yasai Frankel, the uncle of Naftali Frankel, who recently told the press that the life of an Arab is equally precious to that of a Jew. Blood is blood, and murder is murder, whether that murder is Jewish or Arab. The two men took Barkat's advice and comforted one another by telephone. In a separate visit organized by Rabbi Rafi Ostroff, chair of the religious council of Gush Etzion, Palestinians from the Hebron area showed up at the door of the Frankel family looking to comfort the bereaved. And there's a little bit more to this article. Um, I just think, okay, wow. I mean, here there's a lot of people on the sidelines and they can shout. Racist venom, I mean, wherever inside of it you might be on. But here's two grieving families, and they're in pain, and, you know, you would expect if anybody, you know, you could understand lashing out, it would be those in pain from the loss of their sons. But instead of lashing out, they see that the lives are equally valuable. And that is something can't be this can't lose sight of. All right, now on to the less pleasant things. I read this uh, article title yesterday. It's by Mira Bar 
Hillel. Um, she is a British Jew. And the title was, Why I'm on the Brink of Burning My Israeli Passport. And the subtitle is, I Can No Longer Stand By While Israeli Politicians Like Ayalta Shaked Condone the Deaths of Innocent Palestinian Women and Children. She is young, she is pretty, she is a university graduate <coughs> and a computer engineer. She is also an Israeli parliamentarian. <coughs> and the reason why I am on the brink of burning my Israeli passport, because behind that wide-eyed, innocent face lurks the angel of death. Alet Shekid Shaked represents the far-right Jewish Home Party in the Kinsnet. This means she is well to the right of Benj Benjamin Netanyahu, just in case you thought such a thing was not possible. On Monday, she quoted this on her Facebook page. Behind every terrorist stands dozens of men and women, without whom he could not engage in terrorism. They are all enemy combatants, and their blood shall be on all their heads. Now this also includes the mothers and the martyrs who send them to hell with flowers and kisses, they should follow their sons. Nothing would be more just. They should go, as should the physical homes in which they raise the snakes. Otherwise, more little snakes will be raised there. A week earlier, just before 17-year-old Mohammed Abu Qadar was snatched and burned alive, Sheikh wrote, This is not a war against terror, and not a war against extremists, and not even a war against Palestinian Authority. The reality is that this is a war between two people. Who is the enemy? The Palestinian people. Why? Ask them. They started it. So even before the boy died horribly, she declared him to be the enemy, and afterwards, without any apparent hint of guilt or remorse, she was calling for the deaths of innocent women and their unborn babies. She made me think about my mother, sister, Clara, and her three small children who were living in Krakow, in 1939 when the Germans invaded they decided that the Jews all Jews were the enemy and had to be eliminated not least the women and the little snakes they were raising why ask them they started it as the Nazis would say if asked I never met Clara or her children who had perished by 1942 I did meet my uncle Romick who survived by working in Oscar Schindler's factory and his wife Yeti who survived because she spoke good German and was able to pretend she was a fine German woman who had kicked out her Polish Jewish husband as she smiled pitifully at every Nazi she came across. It goes on a little bit more on family history. In Israel, in spite of Hamas' best efforts, not one death has been recorded, nor any serious injuries, although a wedding party was disrupted and got on the television news. And as the bombs rain on Gaza, Israeli teens have taken to tweeting scantily clad selfies alongside their political sentiments. In two now deleted tweets, one wrote, Death to all of you Arabs, you trans fag. Why another proclaimed While another proclaimed, Arabs, may you be paralyzed and die with great suffering. And she quotes another one. Seeing these angelic faces of evil spouting such genocidal rhetoric, I pick up my Israeli passport and box of matches. Not in my name, people. Not in my name. <sighs> this is a very emotional article. It was published Friday 11th. Um, she says Hamas's best efforts hasn't taken any lives in this current bombing uh no they haven't um the current numbers that i've seen so far is 110 palestinians died but none of the rockets from gaza have launched um have landed in israel as yet um however if the three boys that were kidnapped and died were Hamas, then yes, Hamas has successfully <laughs> taken lives. So that statement, I mean, mm. <sighs> mm. there's one person's perspective. And because of this, I, I did look up to see who this shaked lady is. And 
that brought me. Okay, so my next article is on this this stream of um, vitriol that's going on here. As news spreads of the circumstances surrounding last week's murder of 17-year-old Palestinian Mohammed Abu Qadar, many international observers are responding with incredulity. Israeli police say the teenager was kidnapped from his home, beaten in the head, forced to consume a flammable liquid, and then burned alive. They also say they believe the crime was carried out by Jewish Israelis acting out of racist hatred for non-Jewish Palestinian Arabs. But first of all, something okay that contradicts some of the other articles was that you know a lot of violence against Arabs aren't investigated in Israel. But here's a case well, of course, it, it is investigated. So charges that none of these things are investigated isn't true. Um, these details have come as a shock for many Jewish people living outside of Israel who find it hard to believe that Jews could be capable of such venomous violence. Multiple viral videos of Jewish Israelis chanting death to Arabs in downtown Jerusalem earlier that same evening have added to the bewilderment of Israel's liberal supporters in the diaspora. Um, of course, Jews are capable of racism just as anybody else. This is the ugly side of human nature. Um, everybody is capable of hate. Everybody is capable of prejudice. Um, whether that prejudice goes to the extent of necessarily being racist based or not. Um, you know, we are, we're all capable of all kinds of sins, you know, whether you think it's unimaginable or not. Um, Anyway, um, and, and this isn't to justify one one group over another, but rather <laughs> we're equally uh, condemned here. Um, we're equally sinners, and nationality, ethnicity, religion doesn't mean we're not capable of terrible things. I mean, here David was a man after God's own heart, and yet even he committed murder. And, um, you know, and he was a great man of God. I mean, we look at him for an example in so many ways, but we can find some examples from him that are more of warnings of what not to do as well. Okay, so moving on. Clearly such deep-seated hatred could not have sprung up spontaneously. Surely, it had been building up for weeks, months, and years. But why, then, were many Jews outside of Israel only learning of it now, for the first time? Why hadn't they been warned about it by the Jewish communal organizations that are in constant contact with their Israeli counterparts? With their claim to be a premier civil rights group, war where has the Anti-Defamation League, ADL, been all this time, and why hasn't it been sounding the alarm? Two months ago, the ADL published its conclusions from an extensive survey of anti-Jewish racism in 96 languages and from 102 countries around the world. While conservative communicators hailed the work, liberal voices harshly criticized its methodology and subsequent results. In Haaretz, journalist Amir Haas derided the ADL for including Palestinians in the survey without in any way addressing Israeli dispositions of the Palestinian population. Why didn't the ADL ask Palestinian respondents how many people they know whose land was stolen by Jews? In the Jewish Daily Forward, J. Michelson ridiculed the ADL for compiling a questionnaire that even the biggest Philosemites would fail to pass. I'm an ordained rabbi, a lifelong Jewish educator, and an anti-Semite, according to this survey. But the most glaring failure of the ADL's comprehensive survey was its notable exclusion of one critical country, the State of Israel. Considering the Anti-Defamation League's dedication to Israel and professed mission to advocate for the civil rights of all people, not just Jews, 
one would naturally expect it to actively monitor rampant racism in Israel and work frantically to reduce it. Though it made a point of interviewing Palestinians living under occupation, it pur purposefully steered clear of Israeli Jews, the lords of the land. Why did the ADL go out of its way to leave Israelis out of its all-important centennial survey? Zvi Berol made it plain in Haaretz. Were the ADL to conduct a survey of racism in Israel, the results would make global anti-Semitism pale in comparison. Goes on to quote um, certain studies and compare the populations of the U.S. and Israel. <coughs> to be sure, major Jewish communal organizations, including the ADL, have responded to news of Abu Qadar's torture and murder with vigorous condemnations. Admittedly, they have also done so in the past, as in the case of the May 23, 2012 anti-African program, when 1,000 Israelis ran rampant through the streets of Tel Aviv for hours attacking any dark-skinned person they came across. But these condemnations only occur when anti-Gentile violence in Israel spikes to such appalling levels that it grabs the world's attention, and these groups are called upon to respond. Their boilerplate denunciations of violence inevitably include effusive praise for Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his weak words denouncing the racist violence. Accepting these denunciations at face value depends on one's total ignorance of not his key role in ramping up racism by labeling Gentiles as demographic threats and inciting carnage with calls for vengeance against Palestinians. The ADL and its allies have already failed Israel's citizens miserably by wit whitewashing Israeli racism, allowing it to fester to the point where it has now produced a Palestinian Emmett Till with liberal Jews and other Americans august at the extent of anti-Gentile racism in Israel, will these citizens demand more from their leaders and insist upon seeing Israel for what it is, infected warts and all, or will they allow themselves to be lulled back to sleep by these so-called lovers of Zion who are perfectly content to let it burn? Alright, and now, you know, that article delves more into the ideology and just <laughs> of the situation. But <clears throat> let's go back to politics and actions that's actually going on. This article um, is written by a columnist who was formerly a senior political correspondent for Mariv and Haret. She also presents a weekly TV show covering social issues on the Kinzet channel, Mazel Mualam. Alright, in this one, it's uh, not Yahoo and Yaolam prefer airstrikes over ground attacks. On the evening of July 10th, the third day of Operation Protective Edge, Channel 2 News broadcast a survey of the public's reaction to the conduct of its leadership, especially Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. The poll indicates that most Israelis are not eager for a ground campaign in the Gaza Strip, despite the rocket attacks that have spread to the Tel Aviv area and beyond it to the north. Millions have to seek shelter at all hours, and tens of thousands of reservists have been called up by special emergency orders. According to the poll, 91% of the public support the operation, but only 42% think Israel should send ground forces into Gaza, as opposed to 47% who object. Top marks for their handling of the situation went to Netanyahu and Defense Minister Moshe Yolan, who are promoting restraint in the security cabinet and have thus far managed to block the demands of a Gaza takeover espoused by Foreign Minister Avigdor Lieberman. <coughs> For not new, this is an interesting and positive result, easing the public pressure on him for a, gr a ground incursion which he wants to avoid. Although he is sustaining electoral damage for, from the right, his power base, he can console himself with his broad public backing. Um, it goes on and says, you know, some of the reason why they're trying to 
not go in with ground forces is because of what happened in 2006 when they went in. Um, it they sustained a lot of casualties on the Israeli side. I'm going to scroll down to the summation of this. Now he saw the careers of Ulmer and Peretz crashed. They too set out with strong public backing before the Second Lebanon War, and afterward that same public demand did their resignation, said a senior liquid figure who wished not to be named. This undoubtedly has an effect. The problem is that we appear hesitant in the eyes of Hamas, a military power with technological capabilities and the Iron Dome air defense system fears a confrontation with Hamas. It's clear that Bibi, not Yahoo, will pay a price in the right for his hesitation, especially with Lieberman challenging him now, he said. There have been reports since July 9th that the troops are ready to enter Gaza. Hamas is shooting at Tel Aviv, but Netanyahu is unwilling to take a risk. It doesn't look good. This campaign doesn't have any achievement or victory photo so far. I don't accept all this analysis regarding the trauma of the Second Lebanon War that's affecting Netanyahu, says former Kinsit member Danny Yatam, who once headed the Mossad. In a conversation with al Manatar. Yatman backed the restrained approach adopted by the Prime Minister and Defense Minister. The Prime Minister and Defense Minister. Netanyahu and Yellen are right. First of all, the Air Force is doing a very good job inflicting very painful blows to on Hamas, so there's no reason to go into Gaza. Secondly, once you go in with ground forces, you increase the friction with Hamas, and there's an increased probability of collateral damage. Thirdly, as long as it's not necessary to put boots on the ground, you avoid the death of soldiers, and that is also a consideration. Um, the Palestinian Pulse, though, <coughs> one of their articles published the same day as the last one that we read. <coughs> Excuse me. Looking to take a break, Gazans find beaches a war zone. And this um, covers uh, on the beaches, you know, a lot of the Palestinians, because they have so many power outages, the only way to escape the heat is to go for a swim. Um, two members of Khalil Kwanan's family were killed, Ibrahim 24 and Mohammed 26, when the cafe on the shore was targeted. Quinnan said that his relatives and others had been at the rest area watching the World Cup semi-final match between Argentina and the Netherlands when an Israeli aircraft fired a missile directly at them, destroying the place. Speaking to El Monitor, Quinnan said his relatives were trying to have some fun and escape from the extreme heat during a power outage in their homes. They wanted to forget the worries of war, but that simply right, but that simple right costs them their lives. <coughs> he said that the intense shelling brought out the underground water, and debris from the cafe was tossed up to 200 meters, that's 0.1 miles away, noting three children from his family being seriously wounded. And the total number of victims since the start of the Israeli military operation stands at 110 dead including 23 children, 19 women, and 6 senior citizens, in addition to at least 800 injured, according to Kedar, Kedra. <coughs> Gaza's shores at this time of the year are usually full of locals escaping the summer heat in their homes amid power outages, but the beaches, like many parts of the Gaza Strip, are proving to be a death trap, as the bombing of Wart al-Mahara Cafe shows. Gaza's coastal recreation areas are now deserted. Um, I'm going to skip down towards the bottom here. Speaking to Al Monitor, Sarafiti19 explained that her family, like many of their neighbors, left their homes for fear of being hit. She recalled the bombing of a nearby apartment by Israeli boats during the 2012 war, which killed the head of household. Abdo said that what happened. What's happening in Gaza is not a conventional war, but a real war crime. 
And of course, a lot of Palestinians feel that way. The armed resistance factions are suspicious about the bombardment of the shore by gunboats. Al Montour has learned from a source in the Palestinian resistance that shelling the beach may be paving the way for special land operations in the Gaza Strip. So, while one article vehemently says, you know, not Yahoo is trying to show restraint, not sending ground troops, the Palestinians suspect that the bombing of the beaches is leading up to ground troops. Um, let's see, Hamas bites the hand that feeds it. This is in reference, of course, to the territory of Gaza. You know, their electricity, their food, their water, everything comes through from the Israeli state. Uh, let's see, this organization's ge genetic makeup contains a religious divine edict and total commitment to annihilating the Zionist state. Hamas has been stockpiling these weapons which are either homemade or have been smuggled into the Gaza Strip, mainly from Iran and Syria via underground tunnels to sea, Sudan, or any other possible route. Monitoring this information for years, Israel had nonetheless demonstrated restraint. Addicted to quiet, it was willing to pay a price that no other country in the world would, namely a routinely non-stop, low-key trickle of rockets and mortar shells on its southern towns and communities in what is known as the Gaza periphery. That was true as long as the fire was confined to that area. Now that is no longer the case. The fire has spread throughout almost the entire country. In recent days, Hamas has been attempting to target Haifa on the north, barely succeeding to graze it. The lesson is clear. If you cannot defend the southern town of Sidor, it will not be before long when you are unable to defend Tel Aviv. Since the outbreak of the current confrontation, Hamas has been trying to score an indelible operational achievement which will allow it to return quietly to its boroughs. This effort took place on a number of fronts. One of them was to mount a large hostage terrorist attack through a tunnel, the digging of which lasted for years. However, it was identified by the Israeli Defense Forces intelligence. It blew up in pieces on July 7th on top of its uh, occupants. The tunnel was to facilitate the infiltration of terrorists into the Israeli home front. They planned to raid a community or a military base in a bid to kill as many people as possible, try kidnapping others, and then disappear. This attempt was scuttled. The following day, two offensives were mounted against Kibbutz Zikim, which is located just a few hundred meters north of the Gaza Strip. <coughs> A five-member Hamas Navy commando detail swam ashore and charged the coastal kibbutz, aided by drones and infantrymen on Israeli naval forces, killing all members of the detail. The following day, a similar attempt was made, which also, which was also foiled. In tandem, the rocket fire continued in full force. Hamas has been trying hard to target Dimona the southern city that has been identified for several decades with the most iconic symbol of Israel's regional supremacy, the nuclear reactor. All the rockets fired at the city were intercepted by the Iron Dome anti-rocket defense system, which Israel developed in cooperation with the United States. Hamas also tried breaking a taboo by firing rockets at Jerusalem. In this case, too, all rockets were intercepted. The highlight of what Hamas had hoped to achieve was to directly hit Ben Gurion International Airport, which is only a 20-minute drive from Tel Aviv. Many rockets were launched in its direction, but they all missed their mark and were intercepted over the Dan metropolita metropolitan area. On July 11th, Hamas fully acknowledged that it had tried and that it would continue to try targeting the airport. The organization knows that a successful attack would become major headlines in world media, thus dealing a serious blow to Israel's economy, tourist industry, and freedom of movement. At this stage, the Iron Dome system has the upper hand. The possibility of the inflection, infliction of damage to Ben Gurion's international airport plays a pivotal role in the considerations of the Israeli combatant, whether to order a ground operation 
in Gaza so as to stop the rockets or whether to continue to hold back. The organization has also been firing at Tel Aviv for four consecutive days, but all the rockets have been intercepted above this trendy, carefree, and liberal Israeli city. Um, just going to scroll down because i got a few more stories to get through here to read the closing thoughts here. As I am writing this, reports keep flooding my cell phone. Since this morning, dozens of rockets have been fired at Israel. A major fire broke out at a gas station. A house in the south took a direct hit, but the family having gone into the, the safe room was spared. Four rockets were intercepted over Tel Aviv. Air raid sirens wail throughout the country, yet the Israeli public accepts the situation with relative equanimity. These are ordinary people who, half smiling, have come to terms with this existence. They know this is not a battle between people or between armies. What we have here is a battle between civilizations. On the one hand, we have a nation that sanctifies life. On the other, we have a population with a segment that sanctifies death. When we prevail, and that has happened quite a few times since 1948, they go back home to plan their next assault. If they ever win, even once, perish the thought, they will simply slaughter us. This is the whole philosophy in a nutshell, and that is the reason that compels us to always and forever win. Um, the next article was also published on the same day. Global Jihad Benefits from Gaza Crisis there was one big winner from the latest Gaza war, the global jihad. The televised imagery of war, violence, and casualties fuels recruitment for al-Qaeda, the Islamic State, IS, IS, formerly the Islamic State of Iraq and al-Sham, or ISIS, and other jihadist movements. The Palestinian ide ideologue of the modern global jihad, Abdul Azam, author of The Defense of Muslim Lands, argued that all jihads against Islam's enemies, like the 1980s war against Russia and Afghanistan he fought in, were the necessary preliminary for the ultimate battle to destroy Israel. Hazam was Osama bin Laden's first partner in jihad and has aptly been labeled by a former head of the Mossad as the godfather of jihadism. Azam put Israel at the center of the jihad's narrative and ideology where it remains today. Since Bin Laden and Ahmed al zahari founded al-Qaeda in the 1990s, their propaganda and recruitment drives have featured the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as the premier example of the West's war against Islam. Images of American-built jets and attack helicopters dropping American-built bombs on refugee camps from Gaza to Beirut feature in the video messages of the al-Qaeda propaganda machine. Bin Laden spoke of how watching Israel's 1982 siege of Beirut re radicalized him to target America. The jihadists put the liberation of Palestine and especially Jerusalem at the center of their messaging. Bin Laden even put liberating the Holy Mosque of Jerusalem ahead of liberating Mecca from the Saudi royals. I'm going to skip down just a little bit here to keep it a little shorter. For years, Al-Qaeda attacks were primarily rhetorical. Attacks on Israeli targets were few in number, like the 2003 attack on Israeli tourists in Kenya. But global jihad is getting closer and closer to Israel now. Al-Qaeda and its spin-off IS are now major players in Syria and Lebanon. Al-Qaeda-inspired groups are in the Sinai Peninsula and Cairo. The Al-Qaeda franchise in Lebanon calls itself the Abdul Azam Brigades, and the black flags of jihad are flying in Jordanian cities like Man and Zarqwa. Some Israeli security officials have seen the dangerous trends. Tamir Pardo, the current Mossad head, has been quoted as saying Hamas is a lightweight organization compared to the jihadists in the neighborhoods around Israel that pose an increasing danger to Jordan, Israel cri Israel's critical partner. But Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has a long established, established track record of turning a deaf ear to intelligence he doesn't like. This Gaza war will probably end like its two predecessors with Gaza bloodied but still controlled by Hamas. The cycle of violence will just spin again. Al 
bourgeoisism will multiply and grow with more angry young men and women radicalized and eager to strike America. All right, and from Lebanon, who fired the rockets from Lebanon? This was also published on July 11th. Lebanese and Israeli officials have confirmed that at 6.30 a.m. on July 11th, unidentified parties two fired two missiles from Hasbaya in southeastern Lebanon toward Israel. The Israeli response was swift. Minutes after the rockets fell, Israeli army artillery shelled the area where the rockets originated as well as surrounding forests. Lebanese authorities indicated that an early your attempt at a rocket launch had been made hours before at 2 a.m., but the rocket at a nearby location had exploded on the ground due to technical malfunction. About two hours after the successful firing, Lebanese authorities dis disseminated a story that the Army had conducted a comprehensive field survey of the area and had found two Hearn 7 caliber Katyusha rockets. More important, the Army has was for a while able to track the suspect who had fired the missiles. According to the Army, he was wounded and taken to a hospital in the region. The Army is trying to identify the hospital to arrest him. This development consumed political and military discussion in Lebanon, coming as it did during the Israeli war in Gaza and amid talk of the emergence of Sunni extremist cells in Lebanon. Some had wondered whether the Lebanese front would be ignited to support the Palestinians in Gaza. A source close to Hezbollah was quick to tell a monitor that the party had nothing to do with the rocket launches. In fact, they considered the firings to be suspicious rockets designed to implicate Lebanon and its resistance in a battle that serves Israel in time and place. The source also said the real battle now is in Gaza and is being directly led by the Palestinian resistance. Any real and honest support of them would not shift attention from their struggle and cause and would not move the media, political, and diplomatic focus away from Gaza where the battle actually is into southern Lebanon where the battle is contrived. He added, the ones helping the Palestinians in their battle are the ones who send them arms and ammunition into Gaza and who provide Gaza with powerful rockets which threaten the vicinity of Israeli Ginset two days ago and which landed near the Dimona reactor. The July 11th rockets, on the other hand, were a sick joke, amateurish and pathetic, because some of them didn't even cross the Lebanese international border and might have landed in the Lebanese side instead of the Israelis. In short, sources close to Hezbollah think that what happened the morning of July 11th was an attempt to implicate Lebanon and reduce pressure on Israel in its confrontation with Palestinian resistance elements in Gaza, and not the opposite, with a malicious intent to accuse Hezbollah, given that the timing of the operation came on the eve of the 8th anniversary of the July 12, 2006 war. That war between Hezbollah and Israel lasted 33 days. The sources did not rule out the possibility that behind the rocket attempts were extremist fundamentalist forces from the groups present in the Syrian-Lebanese-Palestine triangle near the occupied Golan. Everybody knows that these groups operate with Israeli occupation authorities and that hundreds of their wounded are now being treated in Israeli hospitals. The area from which the rockets were launched is next to the triangle and it is known that Hezbollah does not have a dominating presence there because the area is mostly Druze and Sunni, not Shiite. Still, what deserves monitoring is the news that the Lebanese army is pursuing a suspect that to be involved in launching the rockets. The latest rocket launches are among several such incidents along the Lebanese border in the last few years. On November 29, 2011, three Katyushas were fired from the same area toward the Galilee. Those involved were never caught at the time. A statement claiming responsibility for the incident was posted on the internet by a group calling itself the Brigade of Abdul Azam, the Jihad base, but the credibility of the statement was never ascertained. Three weeks afterward, four more rockets were found in a nearby area. It is not known whether they were being set to be launched. Then on May 26, 2013, a rocket from the area of Majarion 
landed near the Israeli settlement of Matula. Those involved were never identified or arrested. Months later, on August 22nd, someone fired four rockets toward Israel from near Tyre on the Lebanese coast. At the time, the Lebanese army announced the arrest of two Lebanese nationals who confessed to transporting the rockets from Gaza to the Beka Valley and for delivering them to a person in Tyre from where the rockets were fired. The issue then fell silent and was forgotten. Will the same happen in regard to the July 11th rockets and those involved, or for once, will the many unknowns of Lebanon be revealed? I think I have just one more that I'm going to read real quick. Gaza strife threatens Turkish-Israeli rapprochement. Despite the newest round of violence between Israel and Hamas, Turkish Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan is keeping a measured narrative in his response. On one side, Israel would wish to normalize its relations with us. On the other side, these escalations continue. As long as Israeli aggravation continues, it is not possible to normalize the Turkish-Israeli relationship, he said July 11th. Our conditions were clear. Apology for the 11 dead from the May 2010 Mavi Mar Mara incident. Compensation and lifting of the blockade to Palestine. Gaza. I was told that the paper was waiting at Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's desk, but this Israeli operation takes away all of it. This was a much calmer tone compared to an Aragon who lost his temper with the Israeli Prime Minister, Israeli President Shimon Peres, in January 2009 at the World Economic Forum in Davos and stormed out off stage during discussion on Gaza, saying, when it comes to killing, you know well how to kill. On July 11th, however, Erdogan echoed his old rhetoric questioning why Hamas's rockets hadn't killed any Israelis. How many Israelis have died? There are, are any Isra is there any Israeli who died by Hamas rockets? None. But the number of Palestinians killed is almost 100. Israeli lives are based on lies. They're not honest. The Turkish foreign minister also followed a measure of rhetoric. Since the conflict started by the abduction of three Israeli teenagers on June 12, the ministry has kept warning both sides to do all they can to prevent further escalation of the violence. We call on Israel to put an immediate end to its attacks carried out as a method of collective punishment against Gaza and also on the international community, including the United Nations first and foremost, to expeditiously intervene and to warn against the urge for the secession of these attacks. The ministry's July 8th statement read, After the teens' abduction, Israel cracked down on the West Bank with thousands of homes being searched and 400 Palestinians, most of them activists of the militant Hamas group that Israel holds responsible for the kidnapping, being arrested. On June 30th, the Israeli army found the dead bodies of three Israeli teenagers in a field west of the West Bank city of Hebron. On July 1st, the Turkish Foreign Minister released a written statement. It is important that the perpetrators of this act are caught as soon as possible and that this incident is not used as a pretext for collective punishment against our Palestinian brothers who were not involved in it in any way. In this extremely sensitive period when tension has been escalating in the Middle East, all parties should act in restraint and sensibility by driving lessons from sufferings in the past, every effort must be made to ensure that this heinous act does not lead to new clashes with grave consequences and that the peace process resumes as soon as possible, aiming at lasting peace in Palestine. On July 2nd, a Palestinian teenager was kidnapped and burned to death in a suspected revenge killing by Israeli extremists. Israeli police acted fast in search of those responsible and on July 6th arrested six extremists Jews allegedly responsible for the murder. In the meantime, the foreign minister released yet another written statement on July 3rd condemning this murder. We're deeply concerned that these murders might set off a new spiral of violence, the statement read. Necessary efforts should be exerted by all parties to reduce the increasing tensions in the region, especially in East Jerusalem. We re reiterate our call on all parties to act with moderation and common sense in this sensitive environment. Despite 
the Erdogan government's open and unequivocal support to the Palestinians, it is quite noteworthy that Erd Erdogan has chosen a calmer tone for now, this time around, which coincides with the run-up to Turkey's presidential election in August. Fadi al Husseini, a Palestinian embassy spokesperson in Ankar, told Al Monitor on July 10th that Erdogan discussed the latest development in Gaza with Palestinian President Mohammed Abbas and that Abbas would be traveling to Ankara on July 18th for further discussions seeking Turkey's help for a ceasefire. However, Turkey's politically frozen and diplomatically loose ties with Israel make it unlikely for Ankara to have any effort on Israeli behavior. Salahattin Demirtas, presidential candidate for the pro-Kurdish People's Democracy Party, said July 11th that Turkey has lost its influence over Israel and that works against Palestinian interests. It is certainly not enough to condone and seek the end of these attacks, Demirtas said it is just a dreadful situation that a country like Turkey, which claims to be a regional actor, has no influence left on the Israeli-Palestine conflict. We are watching with sadness that Turkey's statements make no impact or are not taken seriously. This shows the grave situation of Turkey's foreign policy. So it's likely that, you know, Turkey's head of state here is just playing politics by calming down his tone. Um certainly looks to be the case but also this last statement you know it was just last week that I mentioned you know countries all countries need more humility we don't need to be seeking for the best seat the most powerful and again everybody like if the president can't have influence on other countries they act like oh you know it, it's shame facing our nation because we're not as powerful as we should be come on Turkey is Turkey. Why do you want power over Israel to negotiate seriously? And and, and vice versa. Um, whether it's the U.S. or any nation. I just find this. Let's have authority or power over one another. It's just maddening to me. Alright, we went, of course, way, way over. But And there's so much more that could be said. So much more that could be looked at. I guess it is a special <laughs> episode since it's running so long. Um, and that wasn't the intention. It's just. And of course, like I said, there's so much more that could be said. So much more that could be read. I don't know. I, it is mind boggling. There's racism, murder, hate on all sides. Retribution, you know, that, that's not justice for those three boys that were murdered. You know, revenge it's not justice it's it's not and mass bombing and impunity um on either side i mean obviously hamas is sending rockets so you know it, it, i'm not saying one side's innocent over the other i'm just saying there's a lot of guilt to, to share to go around um so before you go rah, 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 my team, you know, remember that, you know, n nobody, as, as governments, as political movements, none of them are innocent bystanders. The civilians that get caught up between these political movements, yeah, those are the innocent bystanders. The teenage boys, whether it's the three from Israel, one of which had American dual citizenship, or the two Palestinian boys. One was murdered, one was beaten up, and the one that was beaten up, guess what? He also had American citizenship. So, wow, our own citizens over there, it doesn't matter which side they're on. They're not safe. Um, and, and that's the true victims. Those are the innocent victims. It's the civilians. Because you have these political forces, they have their own agendas, and they will manipulate and feed off of one another's propaganda to continue their own rhetoric. It's the way it works. And, you know, 
Israel's no different than any other nation in, in that regard. Um, you know, just look at your history. Wars and things, they occur out of greed, power lust, hate. They're fueled by a sense of we're just, the other person's wrong. It's looking really bleak. And, um, I don't know. Yeah. Right now, we just have to keep praying. Praying for the salvation of the people in Israel. Jewish or not. Um, praying for the people all over the Middle East. Um, there's Jewish people all over the Middle East. And one thing I didn't see so far was, uh retributions against Jews in other Middle Eastern countries could be just because I didn't specifically think to look that up until just now. Um, a lot to be praying about. And I mean, we know it's in the Lord's hands. It, it, but it, that doesn't totally take away from the burden of you want to do something positive. But the most powerful thing we can do is pray. I mean, sometimes that doesn't feel like it's much because it's not like a physical activity. But fasting and prayer? Um, yeah, I mean, for, for all sides because there's going to be lives lost on, on all sides of this. And there already has been lives lost on all sides of this. Um... You know, I just pray that the Lord will do some work here. I don't know. Some good can come out of this. And, of course, we know that peace isn't going to last in that area um, from the prophecies and everything. And even our own nation, we've been in constant war my whole life. You know, we've had troops, whether they're in Europe or the Middle East or in South America. We've had people fighting all over. Um, we've been fortunate that most of the fighting has not been in our own lands. But, oh goodness. Alright, I better stop now before I just get everybody depressed. Um... <coughs> Proverbs chapter 15 is our Proverbs today. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. The eyes of the Lord in every place beholding the evil and the good. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. A fool despiseth his father's instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. In the house of the righteous is much treasure, but in the revenues of the wicked is trouble. The lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the foolish doth not so. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but the but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die. Hell and destruction are before the Lord, how much more than the hearts of the children of men. A scorner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. The heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge, but the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. All the days of the afflicted are e evil, but he that is of <coughs> a merry heart hath a continual feast. Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is then I stalled ox and hatred therewith. A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger 
appeaseth strife. The way of the slothful man is as an hedge of thorns, but the way of the righteous is made plain. A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish man despiseth his mother. Folly is joy the hand that is destitute of wisdom, but a man of understanding walketh uprightly. Without counsel purposes are disappointed, but in the multitude of counselors they are established. A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season, how good is it! The way of life is above the wise, that he may depart from hell beneath. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the border of the widow. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant words. He that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house, but he that hateth gifts shall live. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. The light of the eyes rejoiceth the heart, and a good report maketh the bones fat. The ear that heareth the reproof of life abideth among the wise. He that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul, but he that heareth reproof getteth understanding. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Mm -hmm.